Thank you to everyone who's attending tonight um, throughout Australia and perhaps um, around the world. Uh, to start off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and, cu and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and of course, traditional owners of country around the world, um, wherever you're joining us from. For those of you who don't know the SHPA, the Society of Hospital Pharmacists of Australia is the national professional organisation for more than 5,000 pharmacists, interns, students, technicians and associates working around Australia's health systems. And for nearly 80 years, the SHPA has promoted and protected the best interests of patients by supporting the practice of clinical pharmacy and ensuring the quality use of medicines. And We've had many COVID-19 webinars um, during this pandemic, and we're very honoured today to have Professor Daniel Bausch with us today. He's a physician and virologist trained in internal medicine, infectious diseases, tropical medicine and public health. He specialises in the research and control of emerging tropical viruses. With over 25 years experience in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, Latin America and Asia, combating viruses such as Ebola, Marburg, Lassa, Hantavirus, and the SARS coronavirus. He uh, is serving as the director of the United Kingdom Public Health Rapid Support Team and is a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he has a very extensive resume before taking on the UK first directorship and joining LSHCM. He well worked at the World Health Organization. He's worked at the US Naval Medical Research Unit number six, um, at the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine and the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, just to name a few. So we're very honored to welcome Dan with us today to speak on the COVID-19 pandemic, what comes next. Thank you, Dan. Great, thanks, Aryan. And thanks to everyone for joining. Good evening there in Australia. Uh, good morning to those of you in Europe. I'm, I'm joining you here from a, a rainy day in Geneva, Switzerland. The, um, well, I, I'm sure you've had lots of discussion and following the news and kind of the technical aspects of COVID-19. What I thought I would do today is try to draw upon the experience that I've been fortunate to have in epidemics and pandemics over the years, as Arya noted some, and, um, and then try to just think what, what will the world look like? What comes next for us? What are the, the key components of all this? And this is all um, crystal ball sort of thing. Well, no one really knows, I think, even the experts. And you've seen different opinions coming from different people. It'd be interesting to look back um, on this lecture a year or two years from now and see what was right and what was wrong. But um, let's plunge in. Um, this is a quote from uh, 2018. We need to be proactive. We can't wait until there's a large problem. And we can't say, well, it's not our business here if it's somewhere else. When we have outbreaks anywhere in the world, it's really everybody's business. It's a threat to everyone and we need to react on a global scale. The big risk is when we have an actual new pathogen, a novel pathogen that has never existed before. And who was the, the genius who um, foresaw this in 2018? It was me, of course, and I am being facetious in, a, in an interview with the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. But, but of course, this is not any real surprise and you didn't need me to tell you this in 2018 or many other people could have told you this in 2018 and, and long before that eventually there, there was going to be a, an infectious pathogen that was really going to sweep across the globe and cause problems. And, and in fact, this of course is not the first one, but it's just the, the most dangerous one that we've had in quite some time. Why, why were we not as ready as we needed to be for this? Let's go through a few um, examples and experience from the, uh, from the past, but first just plunging into a, a few details about this new SARS coronavirus. So as you know, this is a, a virus that we think comes from bats. It's similar to another SARS coronavirus, SARS-CoV-1, that was discovered and caused what seems, of course, um, like a very small disruption in 2003 in, in the SARS coronavirus outbreak that happened primarily in Southeast Asia in, uh, at that time, and when this virus, CoV-1, got into humans from bats. And so a similar virus, about 80% homogeneous to CoV-1, um, SARS-CoV-2, -CoV and probably a very similar process that uh, these are viruses that are maintained in bats and then get into uh, humans either directly 
through contact with bats or their excreta or perhaps through an, an intermediary animal, uh, intermediary host. And you can see on the phylogram on the on the, my left hand side um, that this, these of course are different than the routine coronaviruses that we see. So coronaviruses as a family are are known. We have numerous ones that cause upper respiratory syndromes and gastroenteritis and things in humans and in various animals that are not typically considered um, a, a very serious pathogen until the SARS coronaviruses were discovered in 2003 and then have caused this problem that we have here today and you've all been following the news and I won't go through too much time and giving you the numbers. Of course they're changing daily but we have a true uh, real pandemic where there are very few countries, if any in the world, or maybe a few small isolated island nations, for example, that have no coronavirus um, or COVID-19 yet, but uh, pretty much everywhere in the world is struggling with this. And so you, you can see this is the epidemic curve from a few days ago from WHO. We just went over 4 million cases globally. And you, you can see also that that, that uh, the curve has plateaued um, relatively, and so we're in a, in a plateau stage, perhaps globally, but it's really not one wave. It's not, it's not just one tsunami. It's really a whole bunch of small waves that are going on in, in each country and region and perhaps even city are going through uh, this pandemic at, at different paces with different factors. And, you know, I like this slide because not only does it show these kind of the waves going back and forth and from different size, but you can see the, the boats and the humans and trying to, to deal with it. And, and so they're in, in different situations and, and some, are, some have this huge tsunami that's about to hit and others are in smaller waves, but uh, each one is trying to assess the situation and respond accordingly. And that's really where we are globally. And just to put, uh, come, come back to a little bit more of an epidemiologic approach to that, these are the different regions as defined by WHO, so Pan American Health Organization, for example, an African regional office, and you can see these different epidemic curves in different places. In Europe, um, we've largely, right now at least, um, gone past the peak. Again, each, each country is a bit different, and so this is just the over, overall trend for region. But uh, in other places, for example, um, in Afro, we're still seeing, uh, African region, we're still seeing curves that are going up. The, the colored bars are the cases and, and the black lines are the deaths. Um, in much of Asia, we're seeing that this has already crested, but uh, again, each country and place is different. And so again, as an example of that, if we boil this down, these are some of the curves for the American region. We can see in the United States, although there's still a huge problem in the United States with number of cases, and, but in terms of the epidemiologic curve, it seems to have crested for right now. I, I do want to stress that I say right now because this is not a sprint. This is not something where we're going to be able to say in one month or two months or perhaps even in one or two years, okay, well, that's over and now we don't have to worry about it. This is something that each country and region, again, has to evaluate where they are right now and, and, uh, and where things will go. We have a huge problem in, on the, in communication um, over the last 24 hours with people, for example, in Peru, in certain um, cities in Peru, really a crisis. And then you've probably seen the, the news in Brazil. There's been really a huge um, onslaught of cases recently. And so uh, very different epidemics that are going around at one time. This, of course, is not the first time we've ever had such a thing like this, and you're all familiar historically with the 1918 influenza pandemic, and uh, that happened now just over a century ago. And it was, of course, a much different world at that time. This is an old slide from 1998 and looking at uh, what happened in 1918 and what could happen, which at the time the slide was made it, uh, in modern times, but um, it's still true today. And I think you're all familiar with this and we, we face a much different globe. And so some of the parallels for 1918 are still valid, but uh, others have changed drastically. We have incredible technology, but we have the technology is always a double-edged sword in terms of what it brings and the challenges it creates. And um, the you know, most obvious one, of course, being travel, of being able to, to be in, uh, <clears throat> in um, Adelaide on Monday and New York on Tuesday. But uh, we will we'll come back to this in a little bit and see what we can glean from that.
And, but of course, in between the last century and, and the flu and, and the COVID-19 outbreaks, um, there have been many, many events. These are just some of the major ones that I put here from events in our relatively young century so far that could be classified as major events or, or pandemics. The, um, but I do want to dwell on this for just a minute to look at um, some of the differences in what they represent. And so what we really fear, of course, you know, the, the worst case scenario is a pathogen that is very easily transmissible. And when I say easily transmissible, um, the worst case scenario is, is not um, COVID-19, uh, although, of course, it's a, a very serious situation. The worst would be something that would have true aerosol transmission. And I think most people in the I was going to say in the room, but of course you're not in, in your rooms um, are familiar with this, but true aerosol transmission, of course, is when a pathogen, a virus can be suspended in the air. And so all you need to do is walk in the room and breathe the same air as another person and uh, you're <clears throat> in danger of catching the disease. We see that with, uh, for example, measles is a, a virus that is easily transmitted through true aerosol transmission. We don't believe, and there's no evidence really of, of true aerosol transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, that's different, of course, than droplet deposition. So droplet deposition and when you're coughing and small droplets that can be uh, emitted just from breathing, but don't, they're not sustained for long periods of time. You know, that's, a, that's another, probably the second most dangerous transmission modality, which we have going on right now. And then uh, after that, we have viruses like Ebola, for example, although the transmissibility of, of Ebola is often portrayed in, in the news in, in different ways. In fact, it's not a particularly transmissible virus. So you have to have direct contact with blood and bodily fluids. And in contrast to um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, you have to have that contact during <clears throat> the period of illness of the person who has Ebola. So you're not, you're not going to catch Ebola, for example, going out and shopping at the market somewhere um, people might be even incubating Ebola because they really don't shed any virus until they're in days four or five, six of their, of their severe illness and then have bleeding and diarrhea and vomiting and high viral loads. In contrast, um, one of the challenges in SARS-CoV-2 is that we've seen that uh, this virus can be spread by people certainly um, before they develop symptoms in the incubation period and even people who never develop symptoms and have asymptomatic infection. And so that's a major challenge. So we, we fear um, pathogens that will have, that are easily transmissible, and then of course that have a high lethality. And the, these are different things, right? And often confounded by um, the general public. So Ebola virus, of course, is a, a very lethal virus. And so your, your chances of getting Ebola, even during an outbreak are relatively low in most cases, but your chances of dying of Ebola are relatively high relative to other pathogens. And then most of the, you know, if, you, if you look on the list, the thing that's the exact opposite. So um, many remember the, the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic. And this was a true pandemic that, um, that came across the, the whole world essentially. And you can see there the numbers, 200 million people who, who were infected probably um, far more than so far at least have been infected with COVID-19. But we were fortunate with that virus that it turned out to be really not a particularly lethal virus. And so you can see the case fatality rate in the last um, column of only 0.03%. And so what we really fear is something, the worst case scenario would be something that would have the transmissibility of H1N1 influenza and the lethality of Ebola, um, the two in the middle. But SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 are still um, relatively dangerous viruses. You can see that our global case fatality right now for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is at 7%. That probably will go down as we do um, more and more studies in the community and be able to count the people who have mild or asymptomatic infection. But nevertheless, this is a dangerous virus because it does present something that's relatively easily transmissible and then relatively um, dangerous in terms of its lethality relative to, for example, of H1 influenza, the uh, H1N1 influenza. The um, probably worth you know, adding, I get asked periodically what was the most concerning event. This is prior to COVID-19 and sort of the scariest event that we, we've had so far um, in 
and that I've been in this field, and, and really it was uh, not the not the answer that people would expect. To, I've been in many Ebola and Lhasa and Marburg and SARS-CoV-1 virus and uh, outbreaks and things like that, but really I think on a global scale it was this H1N1 influenza virus outbreak that was really concerning, and the reason for that is because we detected this virus very, very early on as it came up, not through the place that we typically thought that influenza pandemics would start in Southeast Asia, but in uh, northern Mexico, and so it was detected quite early on, and then um, came across the border into Southern California in the United States, and despite early detection, um, we really were not able to control this virus, and it subsequently um, circulated out through, through most of the globe, and so a very somber lesson there in, in 2009. I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but um, you will note that all of these viruses that are that I mentioned here and the, and the viruses that are um, most dangerous for us in terms of pandemics are zoonoses. So they are maintained in animals, sometimes in bats um, and uh, sometimes in other animals, influenza and, and birds and and swine and then make their way into humans and of course if there's enough um, mutation or if they're novel enough virus then when they get into humans um, we have a whole planet that is susceptible to them and that's what we're looking at with uh, SARS-CoV-2 in that we, we don't believe that there's any real immunity to this virus from exposure to SARS-CoV-1 which was limited only 8,000 cases in the world nor um, from other, other coronaviruses. And we're, of course, as you've probably followed, not sure if even infection with SARS-CoV-19 uh, COVID actually confers protection in terms of long-term immunity. So still many questions there. We won't have time, and I won't go into it to, to today, but nevertheless recognize that there are many, many factors that come into this. And so we focus often um, on the genetic and biological factors of a true emerging pathogen but um, many of these are not, o <clears throat> not only due to the, what happens on the biological front, but the human front. And so our interaction with, uh, with animals, and particularly sometimes in more rural um, settings, in, uh, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, an introduction of uh, Ebola virus into humans from either direct exposure to bats or through an intermediary host and hunting uh, an infected um, primate, for example, and then in other settings where there's large industrial farmings or in the setting in China with live markets. And so these are really the interfaces that we need to think about and need to, in the long term, think how to control. So what <clears throat> did I learn or did we learn from the, the past outbreaks? You know, what's worked for us um, and what are the key messages? So connectivity of our planet and the speed of spread of respiratory viruses. And so again, this is sort of a double-edged sword in terms of this connectivity, incredible and in what we can do in terms of getting from one place to another, and that can help in terms of getting support. And the, and the same speed is, is there for communication networks. So whereas we might uh, in a previous era had to have waited for a long time to try to get news of what was happening and, and then be behind. Now we get the news very rapidly, but we're often behind because of course the, the humans and, and the pathogens that they carry are too fast for us often to keep up. And the communication networks are a double-edged sword. So it's great that we can get the information, but it also is an avenue for um, misinformation um, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, social media, of course, as everyone knows, is an incredible tool, but also has the risk of spreading information that is not true. And so not only do we need to sometimes so, um, decipher and, and um, triage the information that's there that is legitimately produced, but we need to fight against anti-vaccination campaigns and, and rumors and different things that happen through the amazing communication networks that we have these days. The, t the technological advances are really incredible if we look at some diagnostics. And so we're, we're in an era in science really where one of the things that for um, millennia has been the challenge of figuring out what the infectious pathogen is, is really um, no longer the, the problem. We're doing this incredibly rapidly with the diagnostics that we can develop um, with, um, with, for example, non-biosequencing techniques. And so it's really quite uh, getting to be not the challenge so much to figure out what's causing the disease, but uh, of course, how do we stop it once it has entered into humans? And then um, therapeutics and vaccine development 
I would say there's incredible technological advances there. We do have, for example, in a relatively short period of time, we've been able to go through clinical trials and develop um, a vaccine for Ebola um, and some therapeutics for, for different uh, emerging pathogens. So we are speeding up there, although we're still too slow and we need to figure out how to get faster. And I'll, I'll come back um, to that in a little bit. Um, we also have seen with these past outbreaks the value, but also the shortcomings of global coordination. But what do we, what do we still need to, to learn? What do we need to do better? First of all, on the political um, front, and, and I don't hesitate to touch upon the politics, and I will come back to that because we have to recognize that health, unfortunately, is inherently political. And so the, the political and the financial commitment is really one of the major things. And so we are in almost all countries quite fickle in terms of our commitment to political and financial, um, our, our commitment to, uh, to public health. And so we are interested when there's an emergency, when the emergency appears to go away, then we're less interested and, and we often commit huge amounts of money when there's an emergency and then take away what's rest or transfer it to other things on what's left uh, when the emergency has appeared to have gone away. This inevitably costs much, much more than if we would just invest in, um, in public health for the long term. And so a lesson that we really should have already learned, but uh, nevertheless, we seem to keep learning and then suffering the consequences of not learning it. We're understanding that there's what I put in quotes there, collateral damage from non-target disease. And so one of the things that happens, and we're seeing it with COVID-19, we see it with Ebola outbreaks and many others, that the world is forced to focus on the particular pathogen or particular threat at that time. But nevertheless, all the other stuff still exists. And so you, you still have TB and HIV and malaria and myocardial infarctions and, and many other things and diabetes. And, and so um, the impact from non-target disease and then of course broadening that out to the general economic impact and, and puts us into this situation as we're seeing right now and a, and a very uncomfortable um, dichotomy of trying to figure out whether we focus on the, uh, the disease of COVID-19 and the direct impact that it's having and health impacts directly or the economic impact for the short and longer terms with lockdowns and, and uh, stay at home orders. So um, there, there's a, a lesson that we need to learn that it's not one or the other, but it takes a, a commitment upfront uh, from the political and financial levels in order to not get in that situation. Um, I'll, I'll probably come back to it towards the end, but uh, I think one of the things that we're learning and certainly learning from, from my um, team in London based and from my time at WHO, and, and we knew this before, but I think we need to um, rejuvenate our commitments to this, that the support from uh, Geneva or London or Atlanta is important, but it's really the most important is the local response. And I, I looked up and picked three small towns there in Australia for you guys um, last night uh, when I was preparing this. I have no idea where they are or what they are, but nevertheless, my point is that it's really the, the local response that is the most important. And, and until we recognize that and until we make sure that we um, have strategies to engage <clears throat> at local responders as true partners in uh, the response, um, we will always be challenged, I think, to control such events. The technology alone is insufficient, and I'll come back to that. One of the examples, just as a simple one without getting into COVID-19, if we look at our team, for example, from London who responds to outbreaks, about half of those outbreaks we've responded to are vaccine preventable illness. And so when we see that, of course, we recognize that the technology is already there. We already have the vaccine and there really shouldn't be an outbreak of this particular illness. But there are, of course, many issues in terms of distribution, production and distribution to the people in need. And then um, we're seeing that, uh, and this is particularly uh, evident right now that, that the global supply chain is a massive issue and we have an incredibly fractured global supply chain right now. So it's not so much just about getting, for example, the primers and probes and the diagnostic tests to uh, sub-Saharan Africa right now. It's about getting just the, the other things that you need to run a laboratory, for example, you know, the pipette tips and beakers and, and, uh, and other standard reagents because the supply chain with the flights being canceled is really so fragile and the productive, um, there's not really the production in many low and middle income countries. 
to, uh, to handle it more internally. So we have huge challenges still there. And then I mentioned, um, can we control and monitor the zoonotic interface to avoid future introductions? So as I boil it down, what do I see really as the fundamental challenges to COVID-19? And, and speaking more generally, not as a scientist, but just um, as a, uh, taking a, a broader public health view of this, not a virologist view. So generally we have the tools to respond, but our ca capacity is not globally scalable. And so we, we know how to control a virus, be it um, Ebola or even COVID-19, but we are often not able to control it on the scale that we need to keep it from becoming a major event. And so the example for Ebola is a, is a clear one where we have had numerous Ebola outbreaks in the past. And although they're tragedies in themselves and each time that they occur, in many places, we've been able to control them relatively rapidly as long as we, they did not get beyond the scale of, of our response operations. And so that, that was the case for many years, but it was not the case in West Africa and, and further complicated um, by the situation, the, the very, um, <clears throat> the very uh, vulnerable situation in, uh, in DRC with the most recent Ebola outbreak. And so scaling um, to these events is really the challenge and we're not able, of course, to easily scale to something on the magnitude of COVID-19. So the barriers to success are really less um, scientific than they are socioeconomic. So it's not so much that we don't have the, the scientific knowledge. We just don't have really the, uh, the infrastructure and the commitment in order to implement. And of course, that, that uh, implementation needs to occur and commitment needs to occur long before the actual, the actual event. And so I ultimately do view this as really a human rights issue. Um, it, it, can we achieve an equitable production and distribution of, of the fruits of 21st century technology, which are presently disproportionately owned and distributed to the wealthiest nations and individuals? And I think that's the challenge. And it's not really so much you know, for those who, who want to put this in terms of being socialist or communist or, or capitalist. It's really not that, that sort of simple sort of um, ideological designation. It's just recognizing this on a public health level that the determinants of health, biomedical determinants are, are one important one, but the social and political determinants are um, the, often the, the bigger impediments. And in, unless we recognize that and advocate on all three levels that we really cannot be successful. And, and we also have to recognize that if we're not successful in Democratic Republic of the Congo or Guinea or Laos or wherever it may be, then we're not successful in Australia or the United States or the United Kingdom. And so we are, whether we like it or not, all connected now. And so it's, it's everybody's problem. I think it should be everybody's problem ethically, but even if ethics were not your, your concern strategically, um, it's everybody's problem and we need to look at it in that way. So what does the future bring for us? Well, we know, first of all, that this is not, although it seems extraordinary to us, and is indeed an extraordinary event in our history, that's not the first evolution of, uh, or the, the first emergence of a novel pathogen. Usually we look at influenza um, as the pathogen that emerges, and we won't go into the science, but different um, antigenic drift and shift processes that can um, periodically produce truly novel pathogens that come out. And so we've had um, influenza epidemics and pandemics over the years, and of course the H1N1 in 2009 that I already mentioned, the most recent, um, but they go back even further. So probably um, influenza, the plague of Athens in 430 BC was um, probably due to influenza, and we won't go through the list here, but so there's the, the, the point here is that these are not new events, um, that the world has changed drastically since these times, and, and so we need to keep up with where we are and where we're going with new technologies and, and um, new socioeconomic ways of uh, existing. What will the future look like and, and what's the way forward? So I think, and this is probably nothing too new for you, but um, physical distancing, uh, I prefer the term physical rather than social distancing. Uh, socially, we need to come together. Physically, we may need to guard, uh, keep, keep distance, but the physical distancing and the enhanced um, hygiene will be as, with us for the foreseeable future. So I think in, in terms of you know, the next year or two, we're going to be um, really incorporating these sorts of things into our daily rituals and, and daily routines 
which may change, of course, some people will probably be working from home for a, a long time. You may have seen, for example, I think it was one of, uh, it was Twitter, I guess I saw this morning, it said that uh, there, there are people would be working at home forever now. And uh, the, the use of masks, there's incredible, um, just different opinions on this, diversity of opinions on masks and how effective they are, um, both in terms of the, the mechanics and the science of the type of mask that you would want to use and whether the homemade masks can work and to what degree, and then um, really kind of what they, what they offer on top of the other things. I think for, for me, not to weigh in necessarily on the masks, but I think if the, the real key is what um, physical distancing can be maintained. And so when physical distancing can be maintained, I personally see no real um, advantage of adding a mask on when uh, physical distancing cannot be maintained. And of course, as we increasingly unlock the lockdowns, then we have more challenges to maintain it. The lockdowns um, are predicated in the efficacy of the lockdowns and getting rid of the lockdowns are indeed predicated on, on individual responsibility or collective responsibility. So I put there the carrot or the stick. Um, if people can really try to adapt to their personal behavior and be responsible in terms of limiting transmission, um, then I think that we can get rid of the lockdowns earlier. And, and if we can't uh, have that responsibility, then we will be stuck with having lockdowns that will um, last longer and then risk being re-implemented as transmission goes up. And it is a dynamic process. And so I, I think that uh, we may see in many different places where we have lockdowns for a while and then um, they go away and then we may need to re-implement if we have reintroduction and, uh, and circulation in the community. So I think it really needs to be, be um, monitored in a very close way and uh, and probably we have to accept that it may change that what we say today may not be what will happen in two weeks because the epidemiology is epidemiology is changing relatively rapidly air travel will be restricted and i think under alter circumstances for really quite a while now and probably um, be considerably more expensive than uh, than it has been i'm um, moving on Testing, no matter what sort of testing you want to talk about and how you want to use it, testing will be an important tool. And so we don't have time to go into the many different strategies that can be used. One strategy I think um, is that I would advocate strongly against is the idea of a, an immunity passport. And what I mean by this is that you would be tested and if you were antibody positive, then you'd say, okay, this is a person who can go and do a particular thing. Um, and where someone who's negative could not. I think we introduce, first of all, an incredibly divisive element into our societies by doing that, but also we really uh, don't understand the immunity of this. And so immunity passports are, I think, a bad idea that should not be implemented. Testing in general will be something that we will need to incorporate into our our life and really where we want to get to in the short term and short term I be I mean one to two years is, is kind of back to traditional typical outbreak control measures and so we get away from this dichotomy of lockdown or not lockdown but to to put this so it's back the genies back in the bottle and so that we can um, go back to case identification testing isolation and contact tracing of smaller numbers which can be successful as long as those numbers are small and so getting back to what is something that is scalable um, in terms of our ability to respond presently not scalable in many places. And then of course on the long term, sure, we, we look to have a vaccine. Most of the attention right now is on the science of, of vaccinology and developing a product and then going through the, the process of, of phase one, two, and three clinical trials and, and uh, expediting that process. So that's that's great, but we also have to be realistic about what happens with that vaccine when we get it, um, who, uh, who gets it first, how does that get distributed to, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I believe there are two of the 55 um, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa, and um, Senegal that have um, vaccine production. And so all the vaccine essentially would need to come in from outside of that continent. And how would that happen? Who would pay for it? And with um, production, which would be inevitably limited in the first phases, how long would that take? So many things to work through. And then the, the long-term economic impact. And I am not uh, 
an economist, and so I can't really comment on this, but we do have to wonder, of course, with the, the huge cost of doing this and the huge cost of bailing out and, and trying to keep economically our various countries afloat, um, there has to be some, some consequence to that, and whether that's recession or economic depression is hard to say, and I'm not the one to, to make that case. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up with just a, a few last slides and then hope we'll have time for questions or discussion, but I, I wanted to point out that where we are right now, and I do not, through this slide, mean to, um, mean to in, in any way minimize the, the danger that we're in, nor the suffering that people are going through um, who have had COVID-19 or lost loved ones to COVID-19 or are suffering economically due to the pandemic. But I also do want to note that, and you've probably seen this sort of thing before, you can see this amazing spike in mortality in, uh, from, the two, from the 1918 um, pandemic of uh, Spanish flu, where, where there were an estimated 500 million cases and 50 million deaths um, and at that time. These are estimated, of course, we didn't have at that time the ability to really count them. And, in more specific ways. If we look at the scorecard, if you will, with 1918 flu and then COVID-19, so 1918 flu infected probably more than a quarter of the people on the planet with 50 million deaths. And what right now where we're at, we have less than 1% of the planet who's been infected with only 4 million deaths. Again, a tragedy, obviously, for the people involved there. But um, on the big scale of things, we're actually doing quite well. And so we have the potential to do quite well. We have the potential to stave this off and have the potential to not have this be something that is um, you know, a, a spike in, that will be in forever in the history of the planet of, of a huge degree of mortality. But we still have a long ways to go. I thought I would just um, give a, a few perspectives of the team that I'm privileged to, to direct in the UK, um, the UK Public Health Rapid Support Team. I won't go into lots of detail here. You can look this up on the web if you're interested, but we are a, a partnership between Public Health England and the London School and uh, are the, the primary entity for the UK for outbreak response, but also research and capacity building. And so we think it's extremely important to, to put these together and um, so and uh, I'd like to quote uh, the famous British statesman James Bryce that uh, medicine is the only profession that works to destroy the reason for its existence. And that's um, our mission as well with the, the UK Public Health Rapid Support Team is to destroy the, the reason for our existence by not only responding to out outbreaks, but helping um, partners in low and middle income countries to build their capacity so that there's no longer the need to respond. This is, um, this is a, a slide that shows some of our deployments overseas. What I wanted to mention here is that I see two sides of, of the coin in the, in the last few months. Um, we had a lot of people in the, in the field for COVID-19 until we were forced to bring them all back to London recently because of um, the, the flight routes drying up. But we're learning um, how much we can do remotely, and I think that's an incredible thing. We're all learning across the planet what we can do remotely, and so those are, you know, these are things that are not only useful now, but will change the world forever, and I think have the, the ability to change the world in a very positive way forever, um, because we recognize that we can never reach every corner of the earth, and so the, mod the modern modalities of remote working and, and transmission of information are incredibly um, powerful and useful. What's also um, the message I think to me is, however, at how our response structures and the architecture of response um, globally is still too reliant on London and Geneva and Atlanta and um, resource rich countries and we really need to be making uh, now a uh, rejuvenate the efforts on the tail end of this um, to be building the, the strategies and the partnership with people and the, and the very competent people in, for example, at Africa CDC and Nigeria CDC and, um, and many partners overseas and really making sure that uh, in many low and middle income countries that they have the capacity to respond that is less and less dependent on those of us who are in resource rich environments. So I, I think there are some reasons, and, and recently uh, I've been coming around to perhaps a, a more idealistic viewpoint for the long term, and, but I am never shy away from the politics nor the idealism, and uh, I, I think that we, we should plunge in in that way. So 
we've, we saw how much can be done remotely. This has accelerated positive change, things that we recognize should have been done in the past, um, but we just never kind of had the time or energy to focus on what we can do through remote working. And so we are, uh, we are learning a lot, and so that's accelerating that in a, in a very positive way. Um, and a, sort of some just big picture meandering thoughts. I'm, I'm amazed how nature is still out there, and so and it's not very far below the surface than the, and kind of the restrictions that we've placed on it. You know, looking at them, at uh, every night the news and different things of this animal appearing where it had appeared in many years. And so I, th I think that um, we have the opportunity to really come out of this and changing not only the way that we do things in public health, but the way that we do things in life in general and to, to re, really re-equilibrate and, and find if I can be aspirational and somewhat idealistic and philosophical, but um, really a determination to, to uh, find a more equitable world and, and harmony with each other in nature. And I think this is really an opportunity for us, perhaps the, the last real opportunity if we look at the way that our planet has been going ecologically, really to do things very differently when, as we go back to uh, quote normal, but needs to be a new normal. And we need to be very um, active and advocating to make sure that the new normal is a, a healthier normal than the one that we have had before. Um, just a few last slides. If you're more, in, if you're interested on the UK Public Health Rapid Support Team, I would uh, encourage you to check out these places. Um, one of the one of my side roles is for the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Normally, I would be encouraging everyone to come to our annual meeting, and our next one will be in uh, in Toronto in November. I'm still uncertain how much of that meeting will be in person versus. Uh, versus remote, but nevertheless, American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, I, I would encourage you really to look this up and to, to join. There's much to be gained, even if you can't come to a meeting and, and uh, in person, whether you're a pharmacist or epidemiologist or a physician, it doesn't really matter. There's something for everyone there, and it's really an incredible global community of practice that uh, is valuable. And then my last shameless plug here is for a small NGO that I was um, privilege to help found uh, some years back now when I used to work in El Salvador in Central America, Doctors for Global Health. And this is really more not on the science side, but on the, the social justice side. And for people who are interested, you don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to have any professional training at all. You just need to be interested in health and human rights. And so I will stop there. And if we have time, Ariane, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I encourage everyone, you can either write questions in the chat or raise your hands and I'll hand over to you. I'll just quickly start off with a question. I saw that you were a signatory and a member of the coalition on behalf of UK First and LSHTM of the COVID-19 Clinical Research Coalition um, and the coalition wrote to the Lancet about this as well. Can you tell us more about the um, Clinical Research Coalition for COVID-19 and, and what it aims to achieve in terms of no research in lower resource settings, but globally as a whole as well. Sure, Ariane. Yes, this is a coalition that's really, first of all, I should say, in its infancy. We just um, we wrote the letter to the Lancet, and that was published, as you saw, a few weeks back, and had our first kind of organizational call, and um, uh, I think just a few days ago. The, um, and, and many things are happening with clinical research, and so you, you've seen, for example, the um, WHO has sponsored trials uh, basically that are multi-center around the world looking at different therapeutics. Um, there's the, the trial in the United Kingdom that has now, uh, was on a call regarding this yesterday, now has enrolled 9,000 patients with COVID-19. But where, where we need to make sure that um, there's representation in my particular interest is um, beyond what happens in the UK or the US. Um, we, we need to make sure that we understand how these trials and how these drugs could work in populations in low and middle income countries. It's not always the same because there can be, of course, different comorbidities and different um, genetic predispositions and, and drugs that can work in one population and not in another population. And, and so we are trying to, um, in terms of our part, you know, one, uh, one of the examples, the I've been the, the co-PI for the 
Ebola vaccine um, made by Johnson and Johnson in Democratic Republic of the Congo over the last year and a half or so. And we're trying to set up that structure so we can use the infrastructure for that clinical trial that could be used for um, subsequent vaccines that would come out for, uh, for COVID-19 and also have some infrastructure in Sierra Leone. And so really at this point, um, that coalition is to try to get all the, the partners together and people who have like interests, but also have capacity. And so that we can make sure that this is not something that is only done. It's, it's fine, you know, I, I don't at all mean to imply that we shouldn't be doing this work in, in resource rich countries. It's fine that things happen in the UK and the US and, and Geneva, you know, we need that support, but we need to make sure not only that um, the, the products of those um, studies that they get uh, to the people in need beyond um, the research rich countries, but also that they're participants in the science. And, and so there, there's an opportunity there also to build capacity in terms of scientific study. And so we're trying to get the best of both worlds by making sure that their participants in that capacity is brought along, but also that they are, of course, the, the beneficiaries of the products that might be produced. Thank you, Dan. We've got one question on the chat. It's a little bit long, but I'll, I'll read it out. I think it's a great question. Where do you believe responsibility sits in any one country to maintain pandemic or epidemic preparedness? As an example, many Australian hospitals did pandemic strategic plans after SARS in 2009, but 10 years later, most of those plans sit in mothballs. So there's, there is a, and we see it locally, nationally, internationally, there's a lack of interest, funding, political will um, to maintain uh, all, all of these things. Um, how do we prevent this happening again? Um, we see budget cuts in universities, in scientific organisations. We see countries um, cutting their funding to the World Health Organisation. Um, what strategies should we have um, locally, globally um, to be prepared? Um, and should we have been prepared for something like this already? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was in Australia about a year, year and a half ago, perhaps for a conference. and. And uh, one of the things that came out of that, and I won't wade into it now, but was the, the very strong sort of dichotomy and difference of opinion versus sort of federal governments and then state governments and, you know, who really has um, the responsibility for, for this. And, and we are, we're seeing this also in the United States right now. And if you're following the news at all and kind of the standoffs that we see with um, Trump, with, with governors of particular states and, and have that those challenges. Some of those are, are um, more just based on the particular administrative structures that exist in countries like Australia and, and the United States, but not necessarily in other places. Although we're also seeing it in the UK where um, Boris Johnson is advocating one thing and Nicola Sturgeon in, in Scotland is advocating another thing. Not unusual in the Brexit era, I, I might add. Um, as you've seen, Arian, there. Um, but uh, I think the really the, the points there's there's two points. You know, the, the way the world works right now is that we have national governments, and those are our administrative overseers, if you will. And so, um, you know, the the responsibility has to has to be with with those national governments to provide the infrastructure and funding um, for not only. You know, the, the, the issue is it's not only pandemic response, it's really health in general. And so we, we need to invest in that. And, and so and I think we need to be very political. I think you need to see that for whether you're voting on a national, regional or local scale, I think you need to ask the question, what is your commitment to, in this case, we can say pandemic preparedness, but I think I would say, what is your commitment to public health? And I think we, we need to, to use our, our political strength um, it's it's great to be, and, and you know for the for the right reasons, and, and I and I'm not really advocating you know what people should do. That's up to each individual. But where it's great when I see people are protesting, marching, calling for one thing or another. That's fine, but we need to translate that to political action, and I think that that needs to. So we need to think that that way. And then WHO, um, as you mentioned, I, I've worked both internally at WHO, I was there for, for three years and then have been, uh, uh, I'm on various WHO committees and have been a consultant for WHO and for many years still on the, the Gorn Steering Committee. And, um, and so I've been involved with WHO for 
a long time. It's not a perfect organization. It has, like any organization, its, it's shortcomings, and, and we need to be honest and expect them to to address those, but we also need to be fair and honest that uh, do we know any organization that doesn't have its shortcomings? Is there anyone that, that, that's perfect? So um, we, we need a strong WHO in the world, and it's a, if we didn't have a WHO, we would need to recreate it, I think, and we might want to recreate it in different ways, and we may want to put pressure on the existing WHO to do things differently, but I, I think in general, it's an important organization that we need to support. I lament seeing governments pointing fingers and saying, you know, WHO has been less than ideal in this. Whenever you try to coordinate 192 countries around the world, it's going to be inherently politically and inher inherently bureaucratic, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a function that we need. One of the challenges for WHO is that, of course, unlike what I initially said, you know, expect your, your local leaders and national leaders to ask them what their policies are on public health and pandemic preparedness. Um, WHO has no direct constituents, right? And so it's uh, if you're in Australia or you're in the United States or in London and you say, okay, these policies of my government are completely unacceptable, then you, you have people who may be marching in the streets or writing to the representative or doing whatever it takes to try to make change, but there's very few people who are marching in the streets and writing to the representative saying, you know, uh, we need to support WHO. And so I think we need to, to recognize that we are all ultimately the constituents of WHO and try to um, offer that support. And I guess it's an interesting point, uh, you know, working in infectious diseases, I find it's, it's not regarded as a sexy part of, you know, healthcare, but maybe this will make people more interested in, it, in how government funds things around, around infectious diseases and research into it. We've got a question from Bishma from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne um, uh, that thanked you and uh, said appreciate your discussion on the political and social determinants on the health impacts of COVID-19. With respect to equitable health service and drug access, where do you see the role of public-private partnerships? Extremely important, I think. and. Um, and we, we are seeing those sorts of public-private partnerships that are coming along. Um, so, you know, one, for example, with uh, various pharmaceutical companies and the U.S. National Institutes of Health announced a partnership a couple of weeks back to try to move forward with COVID-19 uh, production, especially for a, a vaccine. These are extremely important. Um, I'm not one, first of all, to, to say, you know, there are people who who will say that the drug companies are all evil and um, drug companies have done evil things and we need to expect um, drug companies and all companies and all individuals to act responsibly. So it's not really a black and white kind of issue. But um, I think that the public-private partnerships are important. The question really then is, is still, um, how do we how do we make sure that the, the beneficiaries of this um, are not just limited to um, most of those public private par partnerships of course occur in re resource rich areas and so we, we need to have some advocacy to make sure that this is not something that just produces vaccines for the UK the US Australia and, and um, Europe and make sure that it goes beyond that that that's not easily done I would come back to WHO being a relatively neutral arbiter of that and um, and so they're an important role in, in convening and making sure that some of the the groups that don't have a lot of resources to put into it up front that they don't have a large pharmaceutical industry they're not the ones who are going to be funding and, and uh, producing the products but nevertheless they're represented in in uh, in the process and participating and then as I mentioned um, have a have a process to share in the benefits Thank you. I've received a uh, question by text and someone's hoping if you could comment on um, the report from France of a, a series of samples that they had of some unwell patients in France and one of the samples from the 27th of December um, flagging positive for COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2. SARS um, are you able to comment on that and, and what do you think about that? Uh, from a virology perspective? Yeah, I, I've only honestly seen kind of the headlines of that and haven't had time to really kind of get into the details. Um, so 
I, I think it's uh, entirely possible. You know, we, we had considerable, there was considerable travel from China where this, I, I think this whole thing did start somewhere around uh, Wuhan, not in a laboratory and not a, an intentional release, but um, the, uh, but of course there's, there's global travel that had, was happening during that time. And so is it possible that that virus made its way to, to France before the, the recognized introductions earlier on? It, it is possible. I, I'm not familiar with the specifics of that case. I'm only aware of the, the report, so I can't comment really more than that. I, I do think that we have to recognize that when we, when we really know the, the full scope of this in different areas, and we're seeing a little bit by some of the, some of the seroepidemiology work that's being done, although we still really need to better understand and, and validate the testing, but um, we will we inevitably see that there are quite a few more people who are infected than we have recognized. And because the, the mild or asymptomatic people, of course, don't come to clinical attention. And so, so consequently, if you think about that, if we're, it's really only the tip of the iceberg that's the really sick patient. And so un unfortunately, what that means is that you can have a fair amount of transmission in a place until it really comes to you have an, enough transmission so that the absolute numbers of, of sick people are um, starting to then get recognized at care centers. And so was there low level transmission that could have occurred in France from earlier introductions? I, I see no reason to, to discount that, but um, again, I, I'm not familiar and haven't had time to really catch up on that particular report. And another around virology is there's been reports of a, of a new G type and we're, we're aware uh, of the L and S types of, of this strain of coronavirus. What do you think is the potential or the timeline for mutation for this for this for for this type of coronavirus? Um, yeah, I, I think actually the concern of uh, we we do have different variants, which is inevitable when you have lots of uh, transmission of a pathogen. You will pathogen. You will always have a degree of, of mutation, random mutation that will happen. There's the, the concept of fitness in terms of how much the a virus or a pathogen can mutate and still be viable and in, in, in the hosts that it needs to to maintain it, its replication. And um, I'm not concerned that uh, mutation, and we have no real evidence that mutation or different variants right now are associated with different clinical presentations and that sort of thing. I think that's really often something that's overblown and more uh, more something that we see from movies and television and, and certainly in terms of you know mutating to be now aerosol spread and things like that that really doesn't happen in real life there there are mutations that can happen that can um, pose challenges in terms of as we get away from um, mismatches in primers and probes that can be used for diagnostics and so if you have enough mutation so that those primers and probes might not pick up all the variants there are concerns there and then there could potentially depending upon what the platform was from the the particular vaccine um, or therapeutic there could be mismatches so for example if you were using small RNA type uh, as, a, as a therapeutic, um, then if there was a mismatch genetically between a particular variant and the small RNA that you were using, that that might prevent um, or limit the efficacy of that. So, uh, so I think there, it, it is important to understand and follow the mutations, but I think not, uh, not what, you know, the, the, the stories of the mutations being associated with you know, differences in clinical um, results are, I think, are not well-founded, and I'm not concerned that uh, mutations will result in a fundamentally different sort of public health function or public health role of, of the virus, if you will. Ariane, I'm afraid that I am going to have to cut it there because I have a next call to go on to, and uh, I, I apologize if there were other questions, but... Um, Thank you yeah. very much for joining us. Thanks for having me with you t today, so good luck to all of you, and we'll, we'll, Thank you. Ariane, you and I can be in touch subsequently. Yes, definitely. All the best. Thank you, Jane. Bye-bye. And thank you for everyone um, for joining us. Um, all the, pa uh, all the um, attendees joining us, if you could just stay on for a moment um, and fill out um, the evaluation uh, survey, um, that would be very helpful for us. And thank you again to Dan for joining us.